<laughs> We've been studying in Principles of Life, or Research in Principles of Life in Basic Youth Conflicts, this whole idea of there are certain conflicts in your life that are going to affect you all the days of your life that you're living. Because as long as you inhabit a body, meaning your flesh, you are going to have to deal with certain factors that involve every other single human being in the world. They all go through the same things that you go through. And that's why we call them basic conflicts. There are certain things that you have to deal with, certain things that you are going to go through. A lot of times people have discussed with me and said that there's no real textbook or there's no real education process for life. That the Bible, while we're told that it's a textbook, nobody really explains to anyone how to use it as a documented instruction book for everything in your life. Whether they go through Proverbs or Psalms, whether they go through Leviticus or different aspects of it, they seem to keep telling themselves that it's a religious book and not a textbook for life, for something that you should be living throughout the days of your life. And so, Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts basically is just taking from the scriptures, from the textbooks itself, and presenting this information that we all commonly know. And as we were looking at it, we were going through the six basic areas of conflict that are going to affect you before you even get into the study of the rest of it, whether it be in self-image or responsibility, conscience, uh, rights, your freedom, success, and purpose, as well as friends. So in your development as a person, meaning a spiritual being who has been born again of the Spirit, who has come into a knowledge of Jesus Christ, there's still a process that you go through that's called maturation. Some people like to write it off as being part of discipleship or sanctification. They like to put a spiritual term on it. But if you were going to life school and was learning about life, then you would be learning about these principles of conflict. And it's not about positive thinking, and it's not a motivational speaker, and it's not a philosophy. It is a fact of reality that Jesus himself would have given to you if you're spending quality time with him in developing your personal relationship. So in dealing with these areas of conflict, these are just things that you go through on a regular basis. And we already discussed assurance of salvation. If you don't know that you're saved, then none of this is going to do you any good. You need to make sure of your salvation. You need to understand and have comprehension that Jesus paid for your sins, all that there are, and that once you accepted his lordship into your life, that you were determining to give over all your rights, privileges, and self-will to him so that he could direct your life. And that you needed to know that you are a child of God, that you are with him and he is with you always all the days of your life. And that no matter what happened, you would always have that assurance. So that would eliminate all the other problems, really, if you could follow up on that. But in order to pursue life and principles of life, you have to have that assurance. So, as we stress to you, if you hadn't made that assurance, you need to do that. You need to develop that as your first primary goal in life to, no matter what it takes, whether you think you need to go out and get a house, a job, a car, a home, a relative, or whatever it may be, you need more than that to have an assurance of salvation because you're talking about eternity. Your eternal destiny is in the reality of knowing that you're saved and where you're going and where you come from and where you're going to get there. So, that is the number one conflict that you must take care of in your personal relationship. And we gave you tools of how to say, look, if you don't know that, you know, that this is the record and God has given to us eternal life and his life is in his son, he who has the son hath life, he has not son of God hath not life, then you need to go somewhere and find out. You need to go to a church, talk to a pastor, talk to a rabbi, talk to a minister. Keep going until you know. And then once you know, then we'll talk about principles of life. Otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels like a hamster in a cave. Cage. I always say cave, but cage, that you're never going to get anywhere. You're just going to keep spinning your wheels and not accomplish anything in your life because you're always going to be in that area of conflict. It's going to affect everything that you do, no matter it be job, house, home, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, ch children, life, love, liberty, <laughs> pursuit of happiness. And then we talked about self-image, how denying or having a poor self-image and trying to fix your image of yourself is always going to be a never-ending battle where you're always going to keep trying to keep up with the Joneses or the next person, trying to make yourself look into something that you're not, that God had already given you a beautiful aspect that he has created you in his image. 
And so your image needs to be patterned after his image of you, the way he sees you, not the way you see yourself or society sees you. That you need to adapt yourself and to discover all the problems that you're having, really identifying themselves back into a poor self-image because you haven't quite got the reality of accepting what God has said you are, which is a child of God, which is a son or a daughter, which is a co-heir with Jesus Christ. You must have a perfect... A perfect. You must have a proper self-image in order to mature onward in these reality steps of principles of life. And so now that takes us to number three, <laughs> as we went fast through an overview. This third area of conflict that you run into is called purpose in life. Scriptures direct us not to be vague, but to firmly grasp what we know to be the will of God. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Today, however, both young and adult are without clearly guided and defined goals around which they can relate their activities and direction of their lives. Someone has well said that if we do not have something worth dying for, we do not have something worth living for either. Purpose. Why are you here? What are you trying to accomplish? Where are you trying to go? When I got together with my wife and we determined to go into the ministry, we sat down and we compared notes. We had both been through previous experiences in life. We had been through conflicts. We had been through development. We had become solid in our relationship with each other. We had decided that we married each other for reasons that we had determined that we were going to stay with for the rest of our lives. As I told my wife one time when I married her, I said, look, I'm looking for someone that I can grow old with. You know, I said, that's, that was my primary concern. It wasn't just to satisfy her or to be satisfied, but it was to grow old together with. And so, in a sense, you would say, well, that's kind of a weird thought, but once you develop it into a complete picture, you might understand where I was coming from. But the point being is that when we got down and sat down about ministry work, then we decided, I told her, I said, look, I know what I want to do in life. This is what I want to accomplish with my life. You see, that's a purpose. It's being able to sit down with your partner, with your your wife, or with your son or daughter, or with your pastor or your minister, and say, this is what I want to do in life. This is what I want to accomplish. This is what I think that God has designed me for. So, we have in modern days, in this 20th, 20, 20th, 21st century, or as I like to say, last generation, in principles of life, we know we have something that's very famous out there that I believe is the number one perfect book for you to read if you would just get over any biases you might have against it. And that's called The Purpose Driven Life. Is that that Purpose Driven Life isn't the answer to everything in your life. No, of course not. It's just one of the areas of conflict. But it is a perfect textbook for what it was meant to be. There was a purpose why God blessed it. There was a purpose why God had it written. And there's a purpose why God designed it. It wasn't just Rick Warren sitting down and saying, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to make a bestseller. <laughs> no, that's not what happened. You know, If you know the history of Purpose Driven Life and why it was accomplished and how it became what it is, then you would know that God inspired it. So I personally, with all of my 35 years of experience in, in being a born again Christian, I would tell you, hey, go get the book. I mean, not just read it, do it. The first time that I actually sat down after all this controversy that people seem to have and read it because I already knew Rick from before. You know, I said I sat down, read the book, and because I usually bestsellers I don't read because it's like you know most of them are fluff. You know, I don't think they're that good. When I read it, I was laughing at probably the first chapter, I think, or maybe the second chapter. I'm not sure because it was so powerful and so precise and so perfect. It was just right to the point, and I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I personally have posted it several times on the internet on a consistent basis for people to go through so that they could discover for themselves the reality of not just a purpose-driven life, but the reality of having a personal relationship with Jesus. Because you can't read that book without recognizing that it's pointing you to Jesus. And it tells you about Jesus, and it wants you to discover Jesus. And whatever anybody's criticism is that they've ever had about the book is false. I'll tell you that right now. I set out to prove and disprove the criticisms, and I found no one had any valid claim against it at all, not one. And I was amazed because then after that I went and asked for it. You know, I talked to him on the internet, and I said, "Hey, you know, 
We had a lot of criticism about you. I said, what's up? You know? <laughs> but the point is, that is a very good tool to discover in what we're talking about, a purpose in life. You need to have in yourself a knowledge of why or what you're doing right now in this day. I, my purpose in life has been to enter into the ministry and to promote that through the internet, through promoting all the experiences that God has brought me through with this wealth of experience that he's taught me through the scriptures and through the word of God in my personal relationship with Jesus in order to manifest or to relate that to other people in a powerful way using media from my writing ability that I have a natural talent for, that I've always been writing books and writing articles and I've written poetry and I've done all kinds of things with my writing talents to be able to present those in writing and in video and in all the personality that I am to bring all the tools of everything that my life has come to a culmination of and then to lay it all out before people to share with them the experiences of life the reality of living with a God who's real and alive and personal and to demonstrate that in just a video way or videography if so to speak or the videos video devotionals in the sense of letting them have the tools that they can go on with God so that they don't have to go out and buy something. They don't have to go out and do something. They don't have to join something. They don't have to be a member. They don't have to pay, as it were, or to spend years studying. They can be who they are in Jesus right now today. And that's my purpose in life, to present Jesus in a personal, intimate way that a person would know that they can hear God speak without having to go through some kind of mystical marvel or experience or to be some kind of like super saint or to get into some kind of 10 years of Bible study or 5 years or whatever, but that they can know God today. In reality, my purpose is the same as what the scripture says, my purpose for living is, is that to, according to what this Bible teaches us, eternal life is this, that we would know Jesus and that we would know he who sent Jesus, and that is the Father, so that we would know, and this is what eternal life is, he who has sent to know Je to know me and to know he who has sent me. That's what Jesus said. So that's what eternal life is, to know the Father and to know the Son. And that was what my purpose in life is, to exemplify and to do that. And then my secondary purpose was to have a wife, you know, to move forward in my old age so that together, you know, we would go forward. And then as I met my wife and as I discovered her needs as well as her wants, desires, and cares, I knew that God, when he spoke to me, said this. And I tell her all the time, I said, my purpose in life is to take my hand, so to speak, and to put you in it, and then to lift you up to the Father with exceeding joy and say, thank you for loaning her to me so that all the days of my life I had her as my companion and my friend, as my joy and as my my co, as people say, the uh, help me, my co minister, if you want to call it that, or my, my co-laborer in Jesus, so that the two of us together would be one, and we would present the information as she does in her way of living her life, as she's discovering more and more each day how God interrelates with her in a personal and intimate way. Because in some ways, I'm too much for her. Because I wasn't designed for one person. I was designed to share my life and to lay it out for other people. So you don't minister to your wife and make her some kind of subservient slave. No, I share with her the reality of who she is and I make her life comfortable and conformable into those things that God can use in order to touch her in a personal, intimate way that she'd have a separate relationship. So I have two purposes in mind. And then as that manifests itself, my purpose in life is to give her tools and opportunities to witness to her children and her family and to develop that aspect of evangelism in her, that she would go forward and be able to share with them the truth of what she's experienced. So you see how a purpose in life can go from one point and begin to develop into more and more because it begins to open up avenues that you have right there with you. It's not about your vocation. It's about your purpose. You see, a lot of people mistake the two. What they do is they say, when I grow up, I want to be. No. That's not what your purpose in life is. Your purpose in life is not to be a rock star. No, that's your vocation. Your purpose in life is not to be a president. Your purpose in life is something bigger than you are. It's more important than a job. 
a job just actually provides an avenue with which you can demonstrate certain abilities to receive a paycheck so that you can go ahead and use that for whatever means that you choose to monetarily. It has absolutely nothing technically to do with your purpose in life. It can be. It could be a tool to bring you to your purpose in life, or it could be a tool that your purpose in life is made manifest. A lot of times in your vocation, you are given the opportunity to exercise your purpose in life. But your purpose in life is something that you're going to come into conflict with unless you describe, first of all, what God's purpose is for you. Why did God make you? You need to know that. Because otherwise, you're going to be constantly fighting and warring into making yourself into what you want rather than what God wants. Because God said bluntly in the Old Testament that you were created for His good pleasure. And that's it. Pure and simple. Period. No questions asked. No ifs, ands, or buts. God, as Creator, created you for His good pleasure. Now, His pleasure may be as a vessel of honor that you, brings you great satisfaction in having created you and that He will look upon you with exceeding joy and pour upon you certain gifts of the Spirit that He would want you to have in order to be equipped and able to do those things that He wants you to do or you'll become a vessel of wrath where He will regret the day that you were created but He will use your life anyways in order to bring about the salvation of others around you that you will be fulfilling the prophecies that some would be a vessel of wrath and that He will accomplish His purposes anyways because it will still bring Him pleasure not that you should perish but pleasure that He was able to use your life in regardless of what you have done in your personal choices to not follow Him. So your choices hang in the balance, really. You could be a vessel of wrath and go to hell. And still, in some ways, God will use you, but you'll still wind up in hell. Or you could be a vessel of honor where God loves you and He provides that opportunity to enjoy fellowship with Him and eternity to be forever in oneness with God Himself, as Jesus is. So you find within that God's purpose for you. He created you. He created you to have fellowship with Him. He created you to know Him. That's the vacancy that you have inside. That's why your assurance of salvation must start there because it develops a relationship that it continues on in your purpose-driven life that God's purposes are being worked in you. Then, as you discover, you'll discover little things happen along the way. For instance, like one of the purposes in life could be something on a daily basis, your purpose. Today, God has a purpose for you. See, because every day, your day is lined out by God. He has a plan. He's not sitting around going, well, I wonder if they're going to do this or do that, and I'm waiting for them to do this so that I can do that, and then, you know, my hands are tied until they do this. No. God designed every single day for you to have a purpose. He causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the good and the wicked. He purposed the sun to rise and to travel in its orbit. You have every day within you a purpose that you are to meet each and every day. Now, if you don't know what that is, you should get together with God and discover every day the purpose for the ultimate goal of what your greater purpose in life is. If it's your purpose in life, say, is to become or to share the gospel, then if you have prayed through and God has led you into some type of schooling for that in order to prepare you for your ultimate goal of fulfilling your life, then He will take you each step into appointments to fulfill that purpose for your daily meeting with Him so that you would accomplish something in that day that would be leading you onward in order to move from, as we say, glory to glory, or we could say from purpose to purpose to accomplish the greater goal of what God wants for your entire life. So do you see how that could be a conflict? If you don't know that God, first of all, is intimate with you, if you don't know that God is causing your life to happen the way it is, if you think God is not involved, then of course you have conflict. You're always rubbing against His plan for you. You're always kind of like not taking one step forward, two steps back, or two steps forward, one step back. You're flat out missing the point completely. You're walking off cliffs and He's saving you from one one failed experience to another because you're not recognizing that you're doing it to yourself. You think the devil's after you, you think you know your own you think the devil's after you and you think the flesh is failing you when in reality it could be a conflict of your own lack of purpose in your life that you just kinda like toss to and fro out on the ocean, thinking that life is just one experience after another and there's no real pattern or meaning to your life. Maybe that's true. If that's true in your life, then you've discovered your area of conflict. 
you discover that you don't know what you're doing with your life and that your life is a complete mess, that God has not directed you in the way that you should go and you haven't been listening and paying attention to what he's telling you to. Because God intended for you in purposes of life or principles of life as we research these that he wanted you to know how to live your life in an abundant way. Jesus said, I come to give them life, life more abundantly in this life as well as eternal life to come. So it's not a question of abundance of toys so that you could be boys in your man cave because instead of a man cave, you should have an altar in your home where everything is assembled around Jesus himself and bringing people to him. I would that every man turned his man cave into a uh, uh, assembling of the brethren so that they could minister to one another and encourage each other in the family unit. But I know that that doesn't accomplish much because most people are playing games and toys and playing selfishness when they invent these man caves. But your purpose in life was not to satisfy yourself, but to be satisfied by an experience of knowing God intimately and personally and demonstrating that to others. And so if your life has been one mess after another and you haven't really sat down and said, I want to know the plans you have for me, God. I want to work with you and you inspire me with these plans that I'm laying out before you so that I have a goal, I have a direction, I have a goal, and I have a perspective. Because if you don't have a plan, first of all, you won't go in the right way. You won't go in the right direction. Thy pass, O Lord. You know, I mean, God has designed way markers in order to take you from the beginning of your life to the end of your life, and you need to follow them so that when you become born again, likewise, in the spiritual realm, you need to develop on a consistent basis, growing in the knowledge of Him so He can direct you in the way that you should go. But if you don't have a plan and a purpose and a design and you don't recognize those, then I would recommend that you stop what you're doing. Just stop. If you know you're saved and you know... Your self-image is pretty much intact. I mean, everything is a process of working on. Then maybe, you know, your problem right now isn't so much that you, you know, don't have these other issues of conflict, but you really don't have a plan or a purpose. You don't know what your purpose for God is. And maybe, or if you do know what God's purpose is for you, you kind of like sat in churches and heard it enough times. Maybe you don't have a purpose in life. For yourself. May I suggest you get one? Because without a purpose, you're a liability. You really are. You're causing someone somewhere to carry you rather than to carry your cross and to follow Jesus. Because if you would deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus, I think you'd find a purpose in life. One of the most overriding purposes that God has given to us primarily, more than anything else in life itself, is this whole idea of following Jesus. Because he wants us to go out and to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We should automatically always have been raised up as missionaries first. We should already have, as it were, a testimony in our hearts, in our lives, and on our lips, so we could tell every man a reason for the hope that lies within us. And if we don't, we failed in the basics of baby Christianity. The basics, the very simplest of things, the very minutiae of what a Christian should be like. Maybe that should be your purpose, to go, as it were, Sunday schooling yourself back into life lessons so that you would discover who you are, what you are, so you have a plan to go forward. Now, I'll admit, there's a lot of people that grow up in the church and they think they know what they're doing and they kind of get sidetracked and off track, you know, and kind of like down the road to get back in track, you know, and that happens. Sometimes you're, you know, if you're railroading it, you know, and you think that you are on this choo-choo train, you know, and you're the, the locomotive, you know, and you seem to have it every, everything under control, and you, you weren't prepared for when it came off tracks, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Because, you see, in having a proper self-image and an assurance of salvation, when you go off track, you know how to get back on that's the point about the principles of life. It's not about a perfect life lived. It's about knowing what to do with life when it confronts you, when it causes conflict. That's why we study this, principles of life. When you run into conflict, what do you do about it? 
And that's why we're discussing these primary six areas of conflict to begin with, so that you know your baggage and luggage that's come along with you in areas of life that you didn't know you had, that you've opened up, as it were, this suitcase, you know, and suddenly it's like, man, no wonder I don't know what I'm doing. Because there's nothing in this suitcase. I have no purpose. I've just been going from job to job, from, you know, hoping that, you know, if I could hang on to this job, that, you know, I can make ends meet, and then I can, you know, get a wife, and then get a kid, and then I'll grow up while I have a wife and a kid, you know, and then I'll, I'll mature because life will force me into being an adult, and then when I'm an adult, I'll just get a man cave, and then I'll settle back into my successful life, and I'll just be a kid when I want to be, and an adult when I want to be, and, you know, maybe I'll be a, a man of God someday, but I don't think I want to be. Okay, maybe your life isn't not just purposeless, but maybe it's meaningless. Because Jesus said that the tree that bears fruit would be pruned so that it would bear more fruit. But the tree that doesn't bear fruit would be cast away. This is a serious subject your purpose in life. I would rather you be discovered for yourself, by yourself, of what your purpose is than to discover that you really aren't a Christian after all. Because if you're doing what God's will is, then you have a purpose. But if you're not doing God's will, I don't know what to tell you except to repent. The seriousness of how we deal with our life is what God is going to evaluate when we stand before Him on Judgment Day. Because you will be judged. Don't get me wrong. Don't think that somehow grace takes care of you so that you don't ever have to worry about judgment. You'll be judged by Jesus or you'll be judged by God the Father. If you stand before Jesus' judgment, praise the Lord. You know, I hope that you don't go beyond that. But if you stand before Jesus and He says, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. That's a serious condemnation statement. And if you're departing from Jesus, that doesn't mean you're saved. It means you aren't saved. And that you will stand before the great white throne judgment. And God will not find your name written in the book of life. Or if it's there, it's been blotted out. So, your purpose in life really is, in one way, selfish. It's to save your life. But if you give up your life, you shall be saved. But he that seeks to save his life will perish. So, you need to be serious about these principles of life itself because if you don't, you won't go to heaven. You'll go to hell. So, in your luggage and baggage that you're, you've been carrying around, maybe for a long time if you're an older Christian or maybe you've never heard all this before or maybe someone forgot to tell you, then you probably have this big giant piece of luggage that you've been wheeling around that was called purpose of life and you don't have one and you've just been pulling it around waiting to put something in it, you know. And I think it's about time that you took your ticket, you know, and began to recognize that, hey, you need to do something with this. You know, it's in the way. Not having a purpose and having something that big and that empty is in the way of God dealing with you. You need to get rid of that piece of luggage or that baggage that you've been carrying around and get something that's streamlined according to what God wants for you, which just might be a very small piece of luggage that you can carry in your hand. It might be hand luggage where you can turn your heart over to Jesus and discover what His will is for you. And then you won't have such a big, bulky, empty piece of luggage in everyone's way when they're looking at you and trying to determine who you are and what you're doing with your life. Wouldn't you rather have something that's obvious to everyone around you that you are a light of the world, that you are a salt of the earth, than to be dragging around this big chunky piece of stuff you keep throwing things in? Bad marriage, bad experience, bad this, oh we're forgiven, oh bad this, but I was forgiven, oh yeah, bad this. And you have to keep offering excuses for why and what you did in your life. Don't get me wrong, we all have 
experiences that have turned out wrong. But God has said he would take the crooked things and make them straight, as he has in my life, because there's a lot of experiences that will come out in these studies that, man, I mean, you know, there are times where I'm going, Lord, how in the world did I get here? What am I doing when I followed you? I don't understand this. You know, and you look at it and you go, it doesn't make sense. Unless, in the end of my life, I could look back and say, look, the Lord brought me through it, and now I can relate those experiences to people who have gone through the same experiences and touch their lives and share with them the reality of how you take Jesus in everything you do. And you don't hide your sin from anyone. But if you don't have Jesus and you don't do that, then you're just putting in this big bulky thing you're trying to hide, all these dirty laundry secrets, this empty life you've lived this purposeless existence that you don't have for a way of knowing any principle of life to take from it. And everyone around you can see that you're purposeless. Father, I thank you that you have created the universe with all the stars and the heavens, with the universe as we see it, as it spirals in different ways and is designed with black holes and nebulas and all kinds of beautiful aspects that we have no clue really why they're there, but you placed them. And God, I thank you that in creation, likewise, you've designed everything with a purpose in mind that goes so far beyond us that science is continually uncovering secrets we did not know, but we recognize that your hand was involved in doing it, that you created it for some reason. And we don't always understand the why or the wherefore. But God, we know that there was a purpose for it. And you've designed it that way. That you are the designer. You are the creator. You are a father. And you have made us in your image. And because you made us in your image, that means, Father, that you have a design for us. You have a purpose for our existence. You allowed us to breathe and move and have our being. And you brought us to a place of salvation in Jesus that we should know you. And then you've given us your spirit that we should walk with you. As such, Father, I pray today for they which know not their purpose in life, but that you would uncover for them their eyes and open their ears that they would understand the wisdom you've given us from the scriptures to sit down and have a long conversation with you. Jesus, I pray that those who do not have a reason for their existence and have no purpose in life, you would talk to in an intimate way. Not through another elder or a deacon, not through a pastor or a teacher, but through you yourself, Jesus, you would come to them and say, come, let's talk. And that you would, as you did with the disciples, when you sat down on the side of the beach and you prepared fish for them, and you spoke to them, and you spoke to Peter specifically, telling him what his purpose in life was. And you asked him, do you love me? And Peter said, you know what? And he said, feed my sheep. So Peter discovered what he was meant to be and meant to do. Cause those who are watching today, O oh Father, and have discovered that they are carrying lots of baggage around. And as they begin to pull the zippers apart and open up their luggage and baggage that they've been carrying for years and look inside to see what's there, Father, go with them and show them whether it be neat, packed away, and just all put in place, or whether it just be a bunch of junk thrown in there, or even emptiness. Show them today, Father, by your mercy and grace, what your purpose is and what your plan is, what you want them to share with you about their purpose that they want to do. And then open, O oh God, the tenderness of their heart and spirit that they might hear your small, tender voice showing them why, what, and who you are. So that way they would give their will over to you. So their purpose would be your purpose. And together they would walk not in conflict against you, but they would go forward resolving the conflict in their life that began and ended when they opened up this suitcase about their purpose in life and found out they have none. And Father, for those that do know you and have a purpose, bless them. Help them to keep opening up that suitcase and taking out the luggage 
and the baggage, the things that aren't in there and aren't needed to be carried around in the purpose of life, but that they can streamline, make smaller, that they don't need to carry all this extra junk that has nothing to do with their purpose. So God, in all of our lives, open us up to you. Because without you, God, there's no reason for life. There is no plan and there is no purpose. So give us a purpose-driven existence, O oh God, and help us to find the tools that we need, not just to find our purpose, but that we might see you all the days of our lives as we walk with you and talk with you every single day so we would know, Jesus, that we're on the path and we're accomplishing today your purpose for us. In Jesus' name, amen.